the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Direct, O Lord, all our actions by thy holy inspirations and carry them on by thy gracious assistance, so that every prayer and work of ours may begin from thee and by thee. Be happy in it through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our Lady of Divine Grace, pray Amen. for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. This conference is going to be a little bit different from the one that I gave on impediments to holiness. It's, it's more of people who end up not advancing or stunted in their spiritual growth and some of the things that are result in that. And we talked a little bit about that in relationship to impediments, just things like uh, people not detaching from certain things, not having fidelity to grace, that type of thing. But we want to talk a little bit more about another aspect of it is what actually can stunt people in a certain sense in their spiritual progress. This is based uh, on um, Gerli Gulagrange's text where he talks about uh, retarded souls. So these are the people who aren't advancing in their spiritual life. And there's a very distinctive reason why they're usually not advancing in their spiritual life. And if you actually look at it, there are essentially three reasons. Uh, the first is basically the tendency out of original sin towards selfishness or egoism. So the first one is egoism. Now, this needs a little bit of explanation. Uh, when Adam and Eve fell, their choice was not based upon what God wanted or had decreed or commanded. It was based upon what they wanted. So Eve ate it because she wanted these particular things. Adam ate it because he wanted these particular things. And as a result of that, one of the effects of original sin is this tendency to judge things in light of ourselves so that we only are really interested in something or something's only good or we're only going to pursue something if somehow or another I see it as fulfilling me. So there's this tendency towards ourselves as a result of that. The problem is... The problem with that is, is that, A, it's the prescription for sin, because every single sin is rooted in that, where the person's making the choice for themselves rather than for the objective good. The second component has to do with the fact, to that is the fact that it's not keeping its focus on God. In other words, every time, uh, this is one of the real problems with original sin, and now we're all stuck with it, is to get to the point where we're always focusing on God and doing everything for God's sake takes an enormous amount of work because we're on the opposite end of the, that uh, spectrum. So if we're looking at the spectrum where we're doing everything for God and whether then we're doing everything for self, so this is, the, this is the spectrum. Most people are somewhere in here, usually they're not even halfway through with half the stuff they do for God and half the stuff they do for themselves. Most people virtually never get to here because this is, of course, to right next to where they're doing everything for God's sake because that's the transforming union. So most people never actually get there. But there's this actual transition from going from self as the principle of judgment to God as the principle of judgment. Now, there's another aspect of this that's really exacerbating our current um, situation in the church. Modernism has as its principle the principle of imminence, which basically states that objective external reality, in the end, God, but objective external reality is not the foundation for judging whether something is true or not. Rather, they transpose it to the interior state of how, whether I feel or think or whatever, it's me, I become the principle of judgment as to whether something is true or not. And so this principle of imminence basically locks people over here so that in the end, even when they're doing things for God, they're really doing it for selfish motives. In fact, to get to the, the, this is one of the real points, which we've talked a little bit about this too, to get to the point where you go from self to doing it purely for God's sake, a person has to go from interested love, where you're doing stuff for God for what you get out of it, to doing it purely for his sake. And very few people reach that stage. So, one of the things that really keeps people from advancing spiritually is that lack of shift of perspective. 
and it's it's primarily an intellectual thing, but it's also a volitional thing because you have to, in order to keep that intellectual perspective, you have to choose it. That means the principle of imminence has to go altogether. There has to be a recognition that I have to conform myself to an external standard. That's just the baseline for a person so that they don't end up being blocked in their advance. I mean, all of us would admit, admit when you look at the state of the church, we'd all admit that what? That basically everybody, even in the hierarchy, the bishops are only looking out for themselves. Um, uh, even when there's a lot of criticism of even the Dallas Charter when they came out with that in the 1990s to protect the children, that really was to protect the bishops. It was a way in which they could sacrifice priests or whoever in order to keep themselves protected is some of the criticism of that and it's because they're protecting themselves. The priests very often suffer from what we call the nesting principle, which is they're only really concerned about themselves and their priesthood and how comfortable it is. You know, and of course then the lay people, uh, they're just part of the original sin too, so they're only really concerned about themselves. But the point being is, is that there's very few saints left today. There's practically none. They're out there. I've, I've known a few people that are basically saintly. They're not known, of course. But we don't have these great saints because everybody's comes focused on the self, which is a sign that people's spiritual advance has become retarded or blocked because of their focus on themselves. So that means that there has to be the first thing that has to happen to the opposite of this is there has to be a sh complete shift in perspective. A person has to choose that they're going to stop looking at everything from the point of view of the subjective have to stop it. Then they have to shift to looking at everything from the point of view of the objective, which really means you have to look at everything from the point of view of God. And of course, St. Thomas talks about this. You have to do everything proper deum or subspecie day, is sometimes how he says it. You have to look at everything under the aspect of God or you have to do it for God's sake. There has to be that shift in your spiritual life. That's a choice. Intellectually, you can know you have to make that choice, but that means that you're going to have to be willing to do several other things, which we're going to talk about here in a bit. Uh, one, in one in particular, it's number three, which we'll talk about in the next conference. But there has to be a, dis a, a choice that I'm no longer going to do things for myself. I'm going to start doing things for God. And anything I do for myself is pure, going to be purely for God's sake and not for my own. So that's the first thing. This is the first thing that people, that's blocking people particularly today. And you can actually see it uh, in the general culture. People are so self-absorbed and so self-consumed that they really don't care what's happening, you know, generally or in the world or in the culture because of the fact that their life is comfortable. Okay. The next one is neglect, neglect of little things. We're talking about neglect of, the, of little things in various areas of your life. This is one of the things that most people don't seem to grasp is, is that is they think because generally speaking, they're doing pretty good spiritually because generally they're trying to work in their spiritual life that they're actually doing very well. But all of the saints say that the first thing that has to happen is there has to be exactitude in fulfillment of one's state in life, of the, sorry, of the duties of one's state in life. Okay. Duties of state in life. So, let's just take a couple of states in life. Let's just take a priest. So the priest, his primary obligation, full, sorry, full, filled. his primary obligation or his primary function of the priest is to offer sacrifice, the mass. And that means that his exactitude has to do with saying the mass according to the way the church has determined the right, not himself. This is one of the real dangers in having so many options in the mass, because the more options he has, the more he thinks it's his discretion and therefore the less exactitude he's going to have in making sure he's doing it exactly as the church expects. Okay, so he has to do that. Second, he has to make sure that he administers the sacraments based upon 
the legitimate need and request of the faithful. So you'll see priests always making excuses. One of the areas you see this the most is, is, it is um, uh, and you saw this quite a bit in the fraternity of St. Peter, one of the things that you would see is, is it would end up being the fraternity priest who was the guy going to the hospital all the time because none of the other priests wanted to do it, so they would just blow it off. And they would just say, well, get, get Father so-and-so. And, so. and as soon as they found out that the fraternity priest was actually willing to fulfill his duty, they would just unload the whole thing on the fraternity priest. And as a result of that, eventually they would fry out and just it would get to be too much because the priest just didn't want to have to, uh, to do those particular things. The other one that you see very often is him neglecting his office. This is something that's very common, especially in the new rite. Not so much in the old rite. Most of the old rite priests say the whole office. But a lot of the new rite priests, they'll basically, uh, they neglect the, the office in part or in whole because of the fact they say, oh, well, I'm too busy, I got to do this, I have to do that, when this is actually their duty, their state in life. It also has to do with making sure that their prayer life is in order. It's the little things in the prayer life taking the time to actually do extra novenas and extra devotions as well as maybe bumping up their prayer life, etc. It also means just doing those things around the office. It means also the, everything in relationship to obedience. And it's the obedience in the little stuff. As Christ said, he who is faithful in little will be faithful in much. He did not say he was faithful in much will be faithful in little. He said it the other way around. Who's ever going to be faithful in little things? If they're always trying to do the little things because they're trying to conform themselves to the will of their superior will of God through that, then you know they're going to do the bigger things. Whereas if they're unwilling to do those little things, you, it's, it's, a, it's not clear whether they're actually going to uh, do their, uh, the, the little things or they're, they're even going to do the big things. Okay, so you got the priest... What about a nun, monk, or a nun? So, monk or a nun. This primarily has to do with their fulfilling according to their state, and like it has primarily their obligation to follow the rule under which they live. In exactitude. It's the little things. It's the little things in the rule that is going to help them to perfect, to die to themselves perfectly. If they're unwilling to follow those little things, they're not going to be willing. They're, and in the end, they're going to be generally negligent of their duties, generally. And they're going to find there's a kind of a general spirit of disobedience. Why? Because they're really only interested in their comfort and in themselves, which is one of the first things that has to be willing to die. You have to be willing to die to your comfort if you're going to be exact in this. So it has to do with the rule. It also has to do with the will of your superior. And... There's two aspects to this. One is there's those things to which you are bound as a matter of the actual command of your superior, legitimate command of your superior. You have to do those things. But then there's also just following the will of your superior insofar as it is expressed in some manner, even though you're not bound by it. This is another level of obedience that St. Thomas actually helps to perfect obedience. You know that they want this done, so you just do it because you know that's what they want done, and so it's a matter of conquering your own self-will. But the monk of the nun is primarily following the rules. You'll see in many places they're constantly hedging or fudging on the rules. And there are times when you have to set the rule aside for the sake of the common good, but, a lot of, but when you start to see it as a pattern where habitually the superior or somebody else is putting aside the rule or things like that in order to accommodate you know, recreation or something like that when they really should just cut the recreation off and go to work or to do with the, uh, to follow the regimen or whatever the case is. It's when you start seeing that, that you know there's a bit of a problem. There's also a, a person's, and this is in relationship to the monk, and you can say this with a priest and also a layman, is also the self-imposed regimen. <coughs> regimen. Because the rule itself and the, the, constitutions or whatever the case is, whatever you're under, or even the will of your superiors may leave you a certain latitude in relationship to certain things. And so you have to establish your own regimen. And it's in following that regimen, there's two things that happen in, in establishing a personal regimen. The first is that the person dies to themselves. And basically what that means is 
you're no longer going to follow what your appetites want at the moment. Instead, what you're going to do is follow what reason knows. I need, I need to get up at 6. I need to, need to start praying at 6.15. I need to do these things at this time because I need to do these things in order for me to advance rather than just waking up at 6 and figuring, well, I'll start praying when I feel like it, which usually means you're not going to. So this is, uh, that regimen helps you to crush that, follow, that habit of following your emotions in your daily life. Okay. The second thing is, is that the regimen actually makes you more efficient and helps you to be, as you establish that regimen, it also helps you to be more faithful in those little things because you're more consistent and it's more habitual because that's really what we're talking about is that fidelity in the little things. It's a matter of the habit that you're trying to establish. Okay, so that regimen. Okay, so this is a month or not. What about somebody who's married? Right. It's the little things in the marriage that are gonna make a big deal, right? Obviously, we know the big things. We've talked about those. Husband has an obligation to support and uh, to support and to protect his wife, to provide and to protect. And the wife has the obligation to take care of the family or the, the house, generally speaking, and the children. Okay. So we know those things. But we also know that there are little things, even in the context of marriage, that play a key role in relationship to how each other can even advance in relationship to God. By the way, all of these things that we've talked about, neglect of the little things, exactitude of duties in your state of life, you're ultimately serving God in those little things. So a lot of times we, we complain that God doesn't seem to give us direct information about how we're supposed to proceed in a given certain set of circumstances. Meanwhile, we've spent our entire life doing our own self-will and not paying attention to what he is, the indicators he's given to us through grace. And then we wonder why we get to this point and he won't show us what to do through grace, right? It's the natural effect of that. If you're faithful in little stuff, he's going to provide that for you in the end. Okay. So in the case of marriage, there's the little things which have to do primarily to do deal with the unity of the spouses, among other things. So do you, shoot, do, you, do you do the little things so that your spouse doesn't have to go the extra mile if you just, like for example, when you're done, do you pick up your, uh, your plates and you put them in, the, in a location? Do you wash them yourself so that the other spouse doesn't have to do it or vice versa? Um, do you do those little things in order to provide the atmosphere in relationship to, because that's actually where charity becomes perfected, is in doing those little things so that the under, uh, the, with consideration to the other individual so that they don't have to. There's that. There's also signs of affection that have to be done. The little things and the signs of the affection is where a lot of times when, after when people get married, they'll do that very assiduously. They're paying very close attention to the signs of affection, but then when they get married after a while, it gets to the point where they might do some here and there, but there's not the little things that they're doing for the, each other. So you got that that happens. Sometimes it's because you got so many kids or duties and responsibilities, but there should still be certain things along that line. The other thing in relationship to the duties of their state in life, are they praying consistently? Are they paying attention? Are they correcting the children? Not all the time, but in a consistency that the children know, okay, this is what has to be done consistently. Because if you do it all the time, then it can, as scripture says, um, fathers do not nag your children, lest they lose hearts. So you've got to be careful with that. But then there's also the, the fact that the children need the consistent, but it's also the manner. So it's, a, it's the paying attention to how you do it. It's in the, those little things. Okay. Then if you're talking about all of this, not just according to your duties of your state in life, also if you're an employer, or employ, employer making sure that you're, take, you're, you're going the extra mile to make sure that the people under you are getting what they need and that they're being treated justly. On the side of the employee, making sure that if the, if the employer legitimately says, look, I need these things done by 4 o'clock, you're making sure they're done by 4 o'clock, not 4.05, but 4 o'clock. So it's in, it's in, it's, and the reason we do this is because through that process, you're dying to yourself each and every time that you do that. Because ultimately, we're prone to sloth not just egoism, but our comfort, our, 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 our basically the not wanting to do anything arduous, which is the sloth, this is feminacy. We just want to be able to veg and not do anything. And so we want to put off the little things. And so it's, uh, it's that dying, it's in doing those little things that we see the dying to ourselves really become perfected. 
It's not just doing the big things. It's the little things that become difficult over the course of time. Okay, for your average layman, the neglect of the little things has to do primarily with prayer. That's what I've seen it. People aren't taking the time to make sure they're following a regimented prayer life. Or if they have prayer, they'll just blow off certain parts of it. They might go five, six days blowing off and then they'll come back to it instead of just sticking to it on a consistent basis. There was a friend of mine whose father um, was a very, he, he really strove for holiness. And one of the things he did was he had what he called the three to five rule. And basically what the three to five rule is, every three to five minutes, he would quote a scripture to himself to remind himself something about God. And the same thing can be done too in us is if you're going to get to the point where you have recollection, perfect recollection. So you have to remember, let's back up just a little bit. The transforming union is the product reaching there is the effect of a series of things in which all the lower faculties become completely focused on one thing, God. The problem is, is that that trans so the transforming union means that even the little things that distract us from God have to be gotten rid of. And so that ultimately you have to get down to where it's just only about God. And recollection is the process where we're starting to trim out the stuff the little stuff that's just not important in order to be faithful to God. Okay. Sometimes this neglect of little things can be something as simple as, you know, putting out the trash, etc. when you could just let it go till tomorrow. There's that dying to the self, but that's ultimately what you're trying to do is die to yourself to where it's only God. Okay. So back to my observation, then prayer, what happens is, is that people neglect the prayer and it's because they're not, trimming off the stuff that's, the, that's getting them to the point where they're co completely recollected only in God. They'll say, okay, I'll do my prayers in the morning, I'll do them at night, and then I'm good. No, you're not. The goal is to pray always, and that means you're gonna have to, it's the little stuff along the way, it's the little things during the day, taking the time out at certain points, or if you see a reminder of God, taking a moment to re reflect about him or what have you, is gonna be the way in which you're going to get to that point. Because if you don't, See, one of the real problems with uh, worldly things is they cause dissipation, which is basically they cause us pleasure, and so as a result, the soul becomes stunted in its pursuit of things that are painful and arduous. And so this is one of the ways in which um, people just become stunted because they're pursuing the stuff that they want, they emotionally want, psychologically want, or physically want, or what have you, rather than what they really need to be doing, and you can't perfect prayer if you're doing that. Okay. The other one is neglecting of little things has to do with virtue. That's really what we're talking about here. Neglect of little things means that the virtue, because virtue uh, is, is something that you perfect, but you can only perfect the thing when all, if even the minor imperfections in relationship to that virtue are eradicated. So this means that when we talk about neglect of little things, it means there's not a single area of your spiritual life to which you can't fall into neglect. Mm -hmm. That's what that ultimately means. And so the way you're gonna, the only way you're gonna reach perfection and virtue is the willing to die to yourself in each and every single moment that it comes, that, that the situation comes along where the virtue is demanded or that virtuous act is demanded. That's the only way you're ever gonna be able to attain that. And this, Virtue, so just for example, in perfecting prudence, or let's say, say perfecting temperance, so somebody puts out chocolate cake, right? And you've already had enough to eat. What should you do? Well, you should put it aside, right? Or if there is something which, even when you're tired, see one of the things that is that when we're tired, we, send it, we tend to seek the, re, uh, the recreation rather than looking at the tiredness objectively and saying, look, I'm not that tired, I can pick this stuff up and go do this, or I can do this virtuous act. Or when it comes to the food, I can put this aside, I don't need this. Interestingly, St. Thomas says that uh, we as individuals, he picks this up a little bit from Aristotle, but he perfects it a little bit. He talks about how we as human beings 
you might have heard me talk about this. Are you uh, daimonistic? It literally means good demon. It's literally what the term means. But it's a term that actually means that in ourselves is not a fulfillment. We, can't, there's, we're, we are lacking in ourselves those things which will perfect us and make us ultimately happy. So this eudaimonistic means that you've got this good demon who fulfills you. Right? That's, the, that's the thing. It doesn't literally mean that it's demonic, obviously. It just means that as human beings, we have to be perfected by things that are outside of us. If we're seeking ourselves, in the end, we're seeking something that's limited. And as a result, we'll never find fulfillment and we'll never find happiness. It's only in pursuing God that we're, that we're, going, to, uh, we're going to achieve that. That means, though, he says, when St. Thomas comes along, he says, he's talking about this relationship to happiness. But he says, actually, this has to do, do with, the, with in relationship to the pursuit of any good, of all the goods. He says, ultimately, the reason I eat the food is because it's going to perfect me in some way. Because right now I'm hungry, and so I'll eat this, and then I'll, I won't be hungry, and that's a perfection. So he says that in each and every one of these pursuits, there is this uh, wanting to fulfill or perfect myself in some manner. So what does this mean in relationship to this whole business of neglect of little things? It means that the pursuit of the goods has to be based upon not pleasure, which is what most people have, that's concupiscence, or avoidance of pain. It can't be that. It has to be more based on what is my objective good. So, for example, when I eat, do I eat the stuff that tastes good or do I eat the stuff that's actually better for my health, right? Because that's ultimately what it is that we have to pursue. And so if you've transposed it to a bit that tastes good, when you're just, it's just a matter of concupiscence, you have to look at it as to the objective good. This means that the pursuit of all the goods and the pursuit of this objective goods means that it's going to be in the little things that this objective good is going to be obtained. How does that, what does that mean? It means that I'm never going to get to the point where my health is optimized until I get to the point where I'm eating things based purely on whether they contribute to my health or not. If I'm neglecting the little things by like eating a little bit of this, eating a little bit of that, knowing that it's on the end, it's actually not good for me, etc., then I'm actually not, first, I'm not perfecting temperance. The second thing is I'm not perfecting my health. So the point in all this goes back to you cannot perfect any of the virtues by neglecting the little things that pertain to that particular virtue. It's not just the big stuff. It's the little stuff is where that you'll get the big stuff quick. You know, so you get to the point where you're eating pretty healthily, right? But to perfect that takes chiseling away at the little stuff for long periods of time. Okay. So... The third one, which we're going to talk about uh, in the next conference, is um, the refusal to sacrifice. We want to unpack more deeply what a sacrifice is and why people don't sacrifice certain things. But, in the meantime, uh, we want to talk about two other things. First is, what happens if a person doesn't, um, if a person is unwilling to uh, pursue the, or eradicate the little imperfections, overcome these little things, put aside the things they're supposed to, what ends up happening? Well, Gurla Gorgrange says what happens is the person ends up degenerating into derision. Now, derision is when you laugh at somebody precisely to demean them or to lower them in other people's estimation. And you kind of see this. So, You'll see people like, you'll see some guy who's really trying to fast and trying to do, trying to do that. And then somebody will come along and just, you know, they'll deride the person for, you're looking a little too thin, aren't you? You know, that type of, and everybody starts laughing. They're laughing at the person because of the fact that he's actually trying to do that. So what does it mean? It means derision 
derision is the psychological effect that people, it's, a, it's what people do in order to not, to lower the person and lower it so that they don't have to deal with the behavior that the person's engaging in. The person's acting virtuous, I don't want to do that because that requires a certain dying to myself. I have to advance spirits in order to do that. So I'm going to deride this guy to make myself feel better and raise myself above him so that I don't feel like I have to do the same things that he's doing. And so there's that derision that you tend to see that uh, tends to happen. And you see this all across the board that people will laugh or make fun of the people who are actually trying to be virtuous. Now, sometimes people are trying, but they're not doing it right. And sometimes that is legitimately laughable. Other times, though, <clears throat> other times it's not. And so we have to, you know, if someone's legitimately trying to advance in holiness, we shouldn't laugh at them. We should actually take a look at it and say, if, if we feel ourselves inclined to laugh at them, what's in me that's causing that particular problem? And this goes back to the irony of about the egoism. The egoism actually seeks a particular in, something under in relationship to the individual insofar as it seeks the person's comfort or pleasure ple or self-aggrandizement or what have you. It doesn't seek to come to knowledge. Egoism does not want to, the person doesn't want to know themselves. It doesn't want to know himself. And the reason he doesn't want to know himself is because if he knows himself, it's going to be ugly and he knows it. So instead, he focuses on all these other things, the comfort, the pleasure, the, you know, getting p better positions, advancing his career, or whatever the case is, because that's where his focus is. Whereas Christ is constantly telling people, you have to focus on the inside. You know, take out the, when you see a plank, or you see the speck in the other neighbor's eye, look at the plank in your own. He's constantly trying to get us to examine our imperfections so that we can overcome them which is the inversion of actual egoism, right? Whereas egoism is only really interested in the comfort and pleasure, which by the way, the egoism can even come in the form of the religious life and it can even come in the form of spirituality. People can engage in spiritual things because it makes them emotionally feel good about themselves rather than actually doing it purely for God's sake. Okay, but back to the derision. And so you'll see people, the, the derision, St. Thomas says that derision is always sinful, always, because it's A, it's against modesty, B, it's against justice, because ultimately you shouldn't be deriding people, but third, because people should be treated with a certain amount of respect. Um, I mean, sometimes they do stuff that's laughable, but you're not laughing at the person you're laughing with them, so to speak. But there is, the point is, is that the derision is, uh, it seeks to demean people or to lower them so that they don't themselves have to get their act together. Okay. Then, of course, this uh, means that there are several unfortunate results for people who don't, uh, basically for people who are willing to remain stunted in their spiritual life, who don't, tr that are willing to neglect the little things, that they're willing to focus on themselves. There has to be, at which in other words, they're, they're basically contented with where they're at spiritually. You'll get people, well, I'm not in the state of mortal sin, so I'm good. Really? You do realize that all God has to do is retract his grace, and in a very short period of time, you'll be in mortal sin. So you basically, and as they say, you have to be constantly working to advance your spiritual life, or you're regressing. One of the two. There's no, there's no plateauing in the spiritual life. Okay. So the unfortunate effects are going to be uh, dissipation, which means, means there's going to be a drop in virtue. There's going to be a rise in concupiscence for the person who does these things. If a person isn't willing to continually work to advance in their spiritual life, it means that old habits are going to return. Things that they conquer will come back. It means that they're never going to reach um, higher levels of the, of the prayer life and the spiritual life. They're never going to um, be perfecting any virtue. One of the observations, I was reflecting on this, and basically, it's not until you get to the transforming union, which I had down here, it's not until you get to the transforming union that you're perfect in any virtue. Think about this. Even with people who have mastered certain virtues, like all of us, to some degree, have mastered certain virtues, there's not a single person in this room that is perfect in any virtue whatsoever. 
There's not one virtue that anybody that I know of here who could like legitimately say, I am perfect in this virtue. What does that really say about us, right? Okay, and how do you get to that perfection? You can't neglect the little things. You have to keep working on it. Okay, so back up. What this really means is, is that people, people who are unwilling to do these things end up becoming stunted in their spiritual advance, and then they end up deriding people to make themselves feel better. They end up, then usually as time goes on, they end up in dissipation, which really means that concupiscence re-arises, and then they end up with all sorts of problems and difficulties. Okay, so uh, in order not to be blunted in your spiritual life, then you have to do everything for God's sake, and you have to be willing to die in each and every single moment where some little thing is required of you in your spiritual life. The little things. All right, any questions? Yeah. I have two questions. First, um, you talk about about um, looking at yourself when you see things in someone else, yeah. and yet there's something else about not constantly looking at yourself. Correct. And interiorly, where is the <laughs> where is the mean? Where is uh... it has to do with the aspect under which you're looking at yourself. So the person who's thinking about himself too much is really, it's about himself. Whereas the person, if they see some particular defect in someone else or something that somebody does annoys them, then what that tells you is, is that there's something imperfect. And so you look at yourself in order to root it out so to become closer to God. So it's not really, it's your, in the end, it's not you're focusing about yourself. You're really focusing about how do I get rid of this thing to keep, get myself to God. So it's always under the aspect of God. So there's that part of your part. Whereas the person who's just thinking about themselves all the time, that's, it's really, they just, it's like St. Thomas said, he said, we get a certain pleasure out of thinking about ourselves. Obviously, he said, God gave that to us because it's necessary to preserve the first category of natural inclination. That is to preserve our being as it is. However, it has to be moderated based upon what? In the end, it has to be supplanted by looking at ourselves for God's sake and taking delight only in ourselves when we see him there. So it has to do with the aspect. So if we're trying to root out our defects, because then that can be another thing is too, is, is where, especially when people get towards, you know, there's the stage of the perfect, the proficient, and then the beginners, right? That's what St. Thomas calls them. St. John Carl's calls this the unitive, the illuminative, and the purgative. There's a stage right about here before people actually get to the stage of the proficient, where there's starting to be some semblance of virtue and they kind of like it. And so they're paying all sorts of attention to themselves, trying to figure out where their vices and root and things are. And so they're trying to figure it out and they're paying too much attention to themselves. The problem with that is, is that as you get closer to the stage of proficients, this is where you start entering into a certain darkness. You get to the point where you just don't know it. So the more you pay attention to yourself, the worse it's going to get. And basically what that means is, the beginners have to look at themselves. And if you find yourself being um, you know, annoyed with what somebody does or something like that, then what you basically have to do is you have to look at yourself, okay, what is in me that's causing the problem so that I can remove it and get to God or, or not be a hindrance to my pro progress in God? But what can happen is, is here at this stage, there's a dangerous thing because people are doing it because they like what the virtue is doing for them. It's very easy at this stage to get sucked into pursuing the good things for themselves and making themselves feel better about themselves, but ultimately because they want to see their own good rather than the good of God. And so this is the stage where you're most likely to see people become uh, self-absorbed in looking at their own defects rather than only, and because when you get to this stage, this is the stage, this is a transition stage. You've heard me talk a little bit about this before, right before you get into the stage of the proficient. This is a transition stage where you have to stop looking at yourself and you basically have to take a cooperative position in relationship to God. Why? Because you've rooted out most of your defects and you've got a few, but at this stage, you can't make yourself perfect. So you basically have to cooperate with Christ and let him show you where you need to work on, what you need to work on through grace. And so when he shows you, then you work on it. When he, do, when he doesn't, you just don't pay attention to yourself because otherwise that's the stage where people can get stuck in that transition where they're focusing more on themselves and what their virtue is doing for them rather than God, if that makes sense. Get to the point where you get tired, almost exhausted.
exhausted. And so some things you start to let go this week and then you're fine for two or three weeks and then you're back in that we have to let some things go with regards to prayers or some of the little things that you would do. Right. Um, what is your advice or recommendation when people are finding themselves in that type of a situation? Uh, well, in our society, one of the things we do is we actually have a prioritized list of prayer. In other words, there's a list. This you always have to do. Always, right? Unless you have serious grave cause, you must get this done. Then, um, so in other words, we have this list based upon priorities of what you're supposed to. And so if it gets too busy, you just start going up the list and cutting out the things so that you make sure you always get the stuff that's more key and more important. So that's basically the first thing I say is you have to prioritize what your prayer life is supposed to be doing. And that means taking a look at stuff and objectively, usually I tell people, talk to your spiritual director and ask him, what do you think is, should be the priority? Prioritize. Obviously, as a priest, your first priority has to be your office, you know, and your duties, not just doing your duties, but if you're talking about prayer, it has to be your office, and then under there, meditation, and then there's a series of things, right? So, um, but as a layman, you have to get that prioritized, and then... Then you can fluctuate within that, making sure you always get that consistency of those things that are more key or more essential. Um, the other thing is, too, is, is that being said, too, is if you're starting to find that on a regular basis that this, the prayers that you would normally do or should be able to do are getting chiseled away at or you're not getting to all of them and it's becoming a consistent thing, that's probably a sign that there's something in your life that's burning up too much of your time and you need to unload it. You know, unless it's absolutely necessary for your state in life. If it's not absolutely necessary for your state in life, then you get rid of it. So you have to start chiseling away at those things too so that they don't affect your prayer life. So prioritize the prayer life and then take a look at the stuff in your own life that is impinging on uh, the prayer life. The other side of it is too is as people get older and closer to retirement, there should be a transition where they're starting to eliminate the busyness, the busy work, and trying to get rid of that stuff to the point where, and start to reduce the things that they're actually doing to get to the point, because really, retirement, and this is what, I've mentioned this elsewhere, retirement is not meant so that people can go off and do what they want. It's really meant, the reason God gives, and this is what we learn from the book, um, Leisure the Basis of Culture, the reason God gives people leisure, because that's what retirement is, it's leisure. It's the ability to put aside the practical aspects of life in order to pursue the higher virtues. Joseph Pieper talks about that. Where really the retirement should be about, I mean, you can do some of the things you enjoy, like traveling and things like that, but ultimately it should be about developing a more contemplative life and, be, and coming closer to God and perfecting virtues or doing those things that would perfect your virtues or help people to be, so in other words, working in the virtues of um, magnificence and things of that sort where you're actually helping people do things, etc. So there's, there should be, a, it's a shift so that you actually can develop virtues that you couldn't beforehand. That being said, I think it's one of those things that um, I think too many people take on too many things in their lives because they like them and they think this would be good to have rather than thinking to themselves, okay, first let's make sure we know exactly what is essential and we'll only add those things on which will uh, aid these things but not detract from it. So for example, I had a sister who told the kids, because she homeschooled some of the stuff, but she told the kids that um, they would engage in extracurricular activities, and she said, you can pick one extracurricular activity, and that's it. Nothing else. Because otherwise, what is it, what's happening? She's just running them from one place to another, and they're just running around, and the family life is destroyed. Okay, so that's, um, that's what she actually did in order to maintain that so that they could eat the dinner together each night and they could do certain things together all the time, and, but they still got to do some extracurricular activities. So there has to be a balance, really. And if you're just finding that the, the worldly stuff is starting to, all the stuff you're doing on a, on a worldly level, which some of it is necessary, but if you're, if you're finding that you're doing it and it's starting to chisel away at your prayer life, that tells you there's something out of balance. Okay. Any other questions? Is the egoism linked with... Um vanity and appearance as in people who are obsessed with their appearance and I see that a lot too especially at work you know a lot of people just 
they, you know, they, they dress nice, you know, that kind of thing. Mm. But some people are a little bit more obsessed with that than others. And it's just... That's true. It's like, a lot of them want to be fit and want to look good, you know? It's nothing yes. wrong with being healthy and looking clean, but I'm just saying... You know, right. Some kind of... Is that what egoism, technically? Is kind of a, well, egoism is just a self-absorption. Okay. The people who are self-absorbed very often are that way. Yeah. So, St. Thomas makes a fantastic statement. When I read this... I, I, I didn't, I couldn't see the whole context of it. And at first I really didn't pay that much attention to it, but it always kind of stuck in the back of my mind. And then as an exorcist, I saw it in spades and demons. I said, man, they're really like this, right? And basically he says this. He says, uh, you might've heard me say this, but we'll, we'll kind of talk a little bit about this because this actually gets to the question of vanity. Because vanity is ultimately um, concerns about one's externals, excessive concern about one's externals, whether it's your looks or your dress or whatever the case is. So he, he says, he says the sinner, and by sinner he means the person who is falling into mortal sin or very easily capable of falling into mortal sin. He says is concerned about the exterior man. He's concerned about his externals, how it's going to look. So, like with demons, what's so hilarious is they're more worried about how it's going to look like when they show up in hell and the humiliation and the derision they're going to get in hell than the fact that they are taking an absolutely brutal beating up here. They're more worried about that other thing because they're more worried about the externals, right? Hmm. Whereas he says, he says the, um, the virtuous man is concerned about the interior man. He's concerned about his, his virtues and his vices so that his externals are only a consideration in relationship to the virtue of modesty. That's all he's really worried about. Is this modest? Modest, modest. Can't seem to spell that. So what this tells a person is, is where you're at, how much attention you pay to your externals, and how much you pay attention to your internals, right? So where you're at in this spectrum tells you where you're at in these two areas, right? Mm -hmm. So if a person's really concerned about how they look, or if a woman's con overly concerned about her figure, how she looks, what her hair looks like, etc. Now obviously you have to take reasonable care of that stuff. You don't want to walk around looking like a slob. But the fact, it, because then that is contrary to modesty as well. But if this is, what that tells you is, is you're closer to this than you are to this. That's what that means. So this is so, just something to kind of keep in mind. So that the vain person is ultimately the person is worried about this. The exterior man. How am I looking? They want to look good. Does that relate to what you're seeing in shift now? Let's say in, in a, you know, a church like a Nova Sordo church, there's a shift towards being charitable, you know, doing this, doing that. Yeah. Versus um, prayer. And That's right. Yeah, so it's really more saying, worried about. Ironically, it's yeah. more, and this is what the what's so ironic. They used to accuse the the pre-Vatican II church of being overly concerned about the externals of the mass. But now what's so ironic is they're more concerned about external behavior than they actually are about whether people are going in virtue or not. Right. And I guess that links to all the acceptance of immorality that some of the clergy preaches and they kind of feel like, hey, if they preach this or I approve of your way of life, you know, it gives them this acceptance in a way. And right. And praise from it. It's, That's right. It's not, it's an exterior thing, you know, it's not your spiritual, you know. Right. Which is why you got to do what St. Paul says, preach in and out of season. It doesn't matter who cares, you know. You just got to do it. I mean, obviously, you don't alienate the thing. So, like, one of the things I've mentioned is um, anytime I've ever preached about contraception, there was always, like, a two- to three homily lead-up first about the structure and nature of natural law. So that when you got to the contraception, and they, people could actually understand the structure of the natural law so they can't squawk at you. I mean, if they squawk at you, then it just means a sign of ill will. Mm. But on the other hand, so you don't just come out of the gate and start beating people up for using contraception. You have to lay the groundwork because they don't know it. Most people don't know it. Um, on the other hand, you get priests who, um, one time, one priest told me, because I mentioned purgatory during a homily, he just 
chewed me up one side and down the other and said, you should never mention purgatory, hell, or anything like that up from the pulpit, ever. I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> Hasn't stopped me. <laughs> so, any other questions? Okay, well, if you'll kneel, I'll give you a blessing. Benedictio de omnipotentis patris et filii et spiritus et super vos et semper. Amen.